gather and celebrate great moments in history, especially those that have to do with bringing peace to this earth. And what a privilege it is to be here with you uh, this day, 100 years uh, after and commemorating the Treaty of Portsmouth, uh, ending the Russian and Japanese War. Um, what a great uh, day to be with you. Our service and pretty much everything you need is right in your service bulletin. And we will begin by dedicating this peace tablet, which is a replica of the one that was presented to Christ Church and which perished in the fire. And I'd like to just read, before blessing it, I'd like to just read the, um, the uh, commemorative plaque that will go with it. With it. This triptych is presented to Christ Episcopal Church to the greater glory of Almighty God, for the members of this parish, past, current, and future, and for all visitors. In particular, this triptych is presented in loving memory of Henry H. Sr. and Ethel L. Dozier by their son Gary on this fifth day of September 2005. We gave him the benefit of the doubt. We know the treaty was signed on the 5th, which is actually tomorrow, but we'll pretend. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who has made heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And his Lord, the Lord of the Lord, hear our prayers. And let our cry come unto thee. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. 
so we may all, henceforth, be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one, bond, one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who in the former time leadest our fathers forth into a wealthy place, and did set their feet in a large room, give thy grace, we humbly beseech thee, to us their children, that we may always approve ourselves a people mindful of thy favor, and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure Defend our liberties, preserve our unity. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogancy, and from every evil way. Fashion into one happy people, the multitude brought hither out of many hundreds of, of, and tongues, kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those whom we entrust with thy name, with the authority of governance to the end that there be peace at home, and that we keep our place among the nations on the earth. In the time of prosperity, temper our self-confidence with thankfulness. In the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All which we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. O God, almighty and merciful, who healest those that are broken in heart, and turnest the sadness of the sorrowful to joy. Let thy fatherly goodness be upon all that thou hast made. Especially we beseech thee to remember in pity such as are this day destitute, homeless, or forgotten by their fellow men. Bless the congregation of thy poor. Uplift those who are cast down. Mightily befriend innocent sufferers, and sanctify to them the endurance of their wrongs. Cheer with hope all discouraged and unhappy people, and by thy heavenly grace preserve from falling those whose penury tempted them to sin. Though they be troubled on every side, suffer them not to be distressed. Though they be perplexed, save them from despair. Grant this, O Lord, for the love of him who for our sakes became poor, thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O God, at whose word man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening, be merciful to all whose duties are difficult or burdensome, and comfort them concerning their toil. Shield from bodily accident and harm the workmen at their work. Protect the efforts of sober and honest industry. And suffer not the hire of the laborers to be kept back by fraud. <coughs> Incline the hearts of employers and of those whom they employ to mutual forbearance, fairness, and goodwill. Give the spirit of government and of a sound mind to all in places of authority. Bless all those who labor in works of mercy and schools of good learning. Care for all aged persons and all little children, the sick and the afflicted, those who travel by land or by sea, all strangers and emigrants and outcasts. Remember all who by reason of weakness are overtasked or by reason of poverty are forgotten. Let the sorrowful sighing of the prisoners come before thee, and according to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those who are appointed to die. Give ear unto our prayer, O merciful and gracious Father, for the love of thy dear Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favor, and further us with thy continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name,
And finally, by thy mercy, obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
beginning at the first verse. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall rival you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which went before you. Here endeth the lesson.
O oh Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. What a wonderful day and what a wonderful service. Uh, isn't it interesting to hear words that were spoken a hundred years ago and, and think about how we might have said it a little bit differently. A um, couple of things really uh, stuck out uh, in the service for me. This. Um, in the prayer for the country, it says, Almighty God, who in the former time led us our fathers forth into a wealthy place and did set their feet in a large room. Sounds like Wentworth by the Sea, don't you think? <laughs> no wonder they chose that one. Uh, the other one is I, I finally found um, a, a term for my life. Where is it in here? Uh, it's the word overtasked. <laughs> It's nice to have a word for it, you know, it's something other than just uh, too darn busy. Um, Overtasked. I'll go with that. Um, this is a wonderful event. Um, and, you know, in the diocese, uh, sort of a, a byword for us has been infinite respect for one another and radical hospitality for the world. And one of the great reasons to celebrate this is that it, it's, um, it's an occasion of Portsmouth's enormous hospitality to the world. I mean, what more tangible example of the kind of hospitality that Portsmouth indeed is known for, uh, but uh, to do this thing in such an historic and important time is really a wonderful, a wonderful thing to celebrate and, and to, to claim as one's own. Uh, even in these, um, even in these times, and something for which Portsmouth should be forever proud. So indeed, we are celebrating something historical here. But um, I just have to warn you: um, this occasion also puts together two things that your mother and my mother said we should never talk about at the dinner table, uh, which is politics and religion. <laughs> okay, I just want it known for the record, let the record show that I didn't put these two things together. They were put together a hundred years ago by people uh, before we were even born. Um, I told Mark that we, he might want to sit near the door and that we might need to make a hasty getaway from Portsmouth. After I preached this daunting thing, which in that uh, service a uh, hundred years ago it was called the Peace Sermon. What is that? Uh, I don't know. But I have to tell you, I've been um, laboring over what to say in a peace sermon with the Beatitudes as the, as the scripture lesson for the day in a time when we're not at peace. First, a little bit of history. I mean, it's intriguing to me that uh, if, uh, if I read the internet correctly, uh, Teddy Roosevelt won a, a Nobel Peace Prize for this process. Uh, although he never came to Portsmouth himself uh, during this treaty, uh, I believe John Hay was the person who was sort of behind the scenes pulling all the strings. And in this uh, funny sort of uh, uh, a small world that we live in. Uh, just this morning, I was at St. James in Burkhaven on Lake Sunapee, right near the old uh, James Hay Farm. Uh, John Hay. John Hay's farm uh, there in Sunapee. When I said I was coming here, they said, oh, well, you know about John Hay, don't you? So I got all filled up on Sunapee history as well. But John Hay was here uh, doing his magic, uh, sort of behind the scenes. And uh, also interesting to me, I, I didn't know that the actual negotiations took place uh, at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, uh, which we all know is in New Hampshire. <laughs> Let's just uh, get that on the tape, okay? <laughs> but in reading uh, about this treaty and about this war on the internet, I, I was struck by a kind of deja vu all over again. See if any of this sounds familiar. So you have a country that's worried about its security. And it feels threatened by another nation that is far off and perceived to be hostile to it. And the best intelligence reports 
report that there is a gathering threat, even, oh, shall we call them weapons of mass destruction, being gathered, being amassed on the border of Russia uh, to possibly uh, bring a real and certain threat to this nation. And so that nation launches a preemptive attack and indeed it turns out that the real weapons of mass destruction in Russia's power were all of the troops amassed not on its eastern border but on its western border with Europe. Very interesting. Now I'm not sure that I've done uh, the, uh, uh, this war uh, justice but there was enough in it that made me wonder um, about God's working in all this. And why for this peace service would they have chosen the Beatitudes as the scripture lesson? Well, my guess is they wanted to pat them on the back, and themselves on the back and there's that line in there about bless the peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. But you know what? There's stuff before that and after that that ought to give us real pause. I mean, look at who else is blessed according to the Beatitudes. And by the way, I wonder if this is what people have in mind when they put one of those uh, ribbons on their uh, back of their SUVs that says, uh, uh, God bless America. Do you think they're praying that those of us in America will be those who mourn? Those who hunger and thirst? Uh, those who, who are needy in so many ways? I don't think that's what they have in mind. So what did, did Jesus have in mind when he spoke about these uh, Beatitudes? It seems to me that Jesus was just simply describing what is true. That when we are in these dire straits, whether they be spiritual dire straits or physical ones or emotional or spiritual ones, it's then. And and mostly only then, that we know our need of God. That we know our need of God. I don't know about your life, but I'm all the time trying to convince myself that I'm pretty much in control of my life, and I'm gonna keep it together, kind of keep it in the road, and, and I'm the sort of the, uh, the king of my own castle. But people in these dire straits, spiritual, emotional, physical, know that they're not in control. And Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, they are the blessed ones. They are the ones that God is going to be with. And it seems to be the antidote to arrogance. You know, out of all the things that made Jesus angry, it was, it was not, it was not the prostitutes and the tax collectors and all those people, it was the arrogant that made Jesus crazy and received the brunt of his anger. He hated those who set themselves above others and judged them and of course always judged them to be less uh, than they. So these Beatitudes are about not being arrogant but indeed knowing our need of God. Who today would be blessed? Perhaps the people in New Orleans and Biloxi, do they not know their need of God in a way that perhaps a few days ago they didn't know? How about the soldiers in Iraq and all of the Iraqis, perhaps the insurgents as well, who now live in a land of, of terror? I suspect they know their need of God. Or the people who live in the Darfur region or who are refugees from there who simply have never known a peaceful day in their lives. Think of the poor everywhere, and the imprisoned, the unemployed, the 45 million people in America, some of them probably sitting right here, who don't have access to health care. They know their need of God. And somehow, in that, there will be a blessing, says Jesus. These are the people who make no illusion out of security, no illusion that they are in charge of their lives, but they know beyond any doubt 
that forces are at work that make them incredibly vulnerable, and they put themselves under the mercy of God. It's depressing, isn't it, that security is still an issue a hundred years later? But then again, even in biblical times, it was security that was the issue. That's why the Romans put Jesus to death. It was a security issue. He was an insurgent. He probably had the power to bring an army against the Romans, and so they took care of him. Even in our day today, uh, our security needs are so great, our, our worries about security are so great that they're even color-coded. I mean, we have yellow days and orange days, and if it's really bad, we have a red day, don't we? Uh, a red alert. How sad that, indeed, we're still so caught up in our search for security. We still wage war over security. We even elect presidents over security. Um, I thought if I heard George Bush and John Kerry one more time claim that they were the ones who could bring us security, I was going to scream. Because the fact of the matter is, neither one of them can bring us security. You know that. I know that. We would love to pretend otherwise. We would love to pretend that if we just made the right decision at the polls, it would all be taken care of. But it's an illusion. It's an illusion. That kind of man-made security. And I fear we have entered a time of arrogance in this country. And don't get me wrong here, the Democrats are just as culpable as the Republicans. I am not talking that kind of politics. I'm talking about being in this world, but not of this world. I fear for us. We need to listen to these Beatitudes and ask the question, are we too being arrogant? Aren't we being arrogant when we claim to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are? I mean, it wasn't very long ago that we were funding Osama bin Laden. You know, our track record on figuring out who the good guys are and who the bad guys are isn't all that good. And he may be bad now, but there was a time not too long ago that we thought he was good. Aren't we being arrogant to think that we can have it all? That we can have this war and have our tax cuts too? Without any any uh, sacrifice on our part. And never mind our dismantling the safety net that, that undergirds the poor of this country to pay for this war. And all of a sudden, in the face of this hurricane, we find out that we've been dismantling the Army Corps of Engineers and the Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration. What are we thinking? And we have this illusion that we're in charge, not just of ourselves, but of the whole world. I fear for us, I fear for us that we have fallen into that kind of arrogance. And when the whole world is wanting to do something about greenhouse, greenhouse gases, we refuse to participate in the treaties that might bring those down, and then we wonder why the oceans are heating up and causing more hurricanes. We can't have it both ways. We have to know our need of God. And I think as a nation, as a people, and certainly as Christian people, we have to remember that indeed we are dependent upon God. Security is an illusion. The bad news is that it's an illusion. The good news is that it can be had, but not at our hands, but at God's hands. The way we can achieve peace and security in this day and age, just as any day and age, is only through justice, and only through humility, and only in self-giving, and only in risk-taking. The way the folks here in Portsmouth took a risk to put together a peace treaty a hundred years ago to pay attention to us as a community of people, as a nation of people, as a community of nations. It's the only way that real security and peace will come about. Not through more war, but through that kind of self-giving, that kind of risk-taking. And the good news is that real security comes from our life in God. If we know we are loved by this God beyond our wildest imagining, 
If we know that in the end, we're all going to heaven and we are going to be taken care of, I believe it with my whole heart, then we can afford to take some of these risks for peace. We can afford not to be the richest, the best, the fastest, the wealthiest, all of those things. We, we don't have to have all of those things. We can actually let go of some of those things in order to do the right things. For peace, for justice, and for the world. We could, you and I, become peacemakers again. At the moment, we are war makers. Let's just be clear about that. And let's confess that to God. But let's keep dreaming, as they did 100 years ago, that we could be peacemakers. We could be peacemakers if we found our security not in, in uh, uh, bigger contraptions at the airports to detect weapons, but if we found our security in the living God. We could become peacemakers again. Amen.
Before we conclude our service, I have a few recognitions I would like to make. Um, one is for our beautiful choir. Uh, it's a combined choir from Churches of the Portsmouth Ministerium under the direction of Alexis Zurichi and her husband Nicholas Zurichi played the trumpet for us. So I want to thank the choir for the wonderful music that you provided for us in the service today. Thank you. And also I'd like to thank uh, uh, ministers from the Portsmouth Area Ministerium as well, uh, Don uh, Shippey and Deb Ship, who are with us to celebrate and to partake in the service today. So thank you for coming and being part of our celebration today. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, Grover Marshall, um, who coordinated this whole day and spent many months coordinating it, coordinating it and be a part of the committee that um, helped orchestrate um, all the different events that are surrounded the peace treaty. So um, thank you, Grover, for your hard work and for the many hours that you spent preparing for the service in many different dimensions. And once again, uh, Gary, thank you for the gift of the plaque. The, the, the peace plaque here yeah. that's going to hang in the, in the, uh, in the right at the entrance of our church for all visitors to come in to to be to commemorate this event that happened 100 years ago at the old Christ Church. So thank you for that gift, Gary, and, and all the coordinating you had to do to get it here too. Uh, <laughs> and there was a lot of tech to, to have to do with that. Uh, Bishop, thank you as always um, for, for your wonderful words, um, for your presence here, which brings another aspect of. Uh, dignity to this moment in a sense of having the bishop come to be among us and also to show the, the importance of this event that the bishop came to be among us. So thank you for taking your time on your busy schedule for wanting to task. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you all for, for participating in this event today. We have a reception uh, following the service right down the hallway to the left here and please come on in. Um, we're not even going to process the bed for all we know. We're going straight that way, that way you follow us. <laughs> right in for the reception afterwards. So thank you for being part of the service. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.